Promise Nest is a very educative program as, asking questions uh, about contemporary challenges confronting us as a nation. And in the process, looking for relevant answers, especially from people with accumulated wisdom, depending on the subject that we are discussing. And I'm happy you have tuned to GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. Young people are the wealth of the nation. But of late, our young people are also being a challenge with some of the contemporary. It's not only, only a Ghanaian challenge. The issue of unemployment is a global challenge. But then we as a people must find our own way of turning the challenge to opportunity. And thank God, we have men and women in this country who have what it takes to raise our young people to become what we all want them to become. And I'm happy to have uh, on what is next, Dr. Tony Otin Jesse, a former uh, president of Association of Ghana Industries. Doc, welcome to what is next. Thank you very much, Osofo. <laughs> you are a man of many parts. Some have known you as former chairman, the governing council of University of Ghana. Some will know you as a uh, president association of of Ghana Industries. Some will know you, you know. But help my viewers. Who is Tony Otin Yebwa? Tony Otin Jesse. Otin Jesse. Sorry. Yes, it's a uh, it's uh, uh, that's me. Uh, like you said, uh, a Ghanaian involved mainly with the private sector. And uh, my passion actually is with manufacturing. Mm. And I think that uh, it is imperative that our country take manufacturing seriously mm. if we are to make headway as a nation. Mm. Yes, Doc, now there are young people in Ghana today who have heard the stories and achievements that people like uh, May she rest in peace, Dr. Mrs. Esther Oklu, people who have heard about Mr. Apia Minka, uh, Mr. Samuel Tobin, uh, Amo Tobin, Nano Usu Aferi, Dr. Yao Edu Jemfi, and people like you. And, and they are excited, you know, about your, story, or your stories, but they have a deep-seated fear that with the current situation challenges, they may not become the Apia Menkens, they cannot become the, the uh, Esther Oclus. When they think like that, are they, are they thinking right? No, I don't think they are thinking right. I mean, every, every generation comes with its own challenges. So um, it's not surprising we have challenges now. But I think, like you said before we sat down, I mean, out of some of these challenges arise opportunities. And the thing about the people you have mentioned, uh, uh, Esther Oklu, Apia Minka, and I would even add people like Makofi, who I, I, I knew very early. He was a friend of my old man. Uh, uh, people like Sion, who uh, single-handedly built what was uh, reputed to be the largest brewery, definitely in West Africa, if not in Africa. You know, I mean, these are all people who at different times have risen to the challenge, not just of working for themselves and being in the private sector, but particularly for me, of being going into manufacturing. And it is that which has driven their name and make us remember them now, you know. To come back to your question, yes, uh, there may appear to be some challenges, uh, but challenges come with every generation. And true entrepreneurs find ways to do what they must do in spite of these challenges. So the young people of today need not despair, give up, and think that things uh, there was some rosy past when it was easier to do things. It has never been that way. But is the current business climate enabling enough for young people, you know, especially young entrepreneurs and beginners in industry, to be competitive both locally and internationally? You, you understand the environment, and I'll tell you, this recent, uh, just pre-Christmas, uh, made uh, eat made in Ghana rice. Most of the rice mills which are producing rice now are owned by young people. It's true there are one or two big companies in there, but people whose name I cannot mention, but who I know 
you know, uh, have been involved in milling rice and contributed to this eat made in Ghana rice. So across industries, you will find that there are always young people coming up who, despite whatever challenges they have, once you are entrepreneur, it is your job to do what you want to do in spite of the challenges. And so that is the big thing. Are there entrepreneurs or there are no entrepreneurs? But are there support systems? Support systems you will have, not, not to the same level that you have across countries and over time. But at any point in time, you can be sure that there will be some support in systems. Let me give you an example. If you look at um, uh, the National Board for Small Scale Industry, and there is such a body whose aim primarily is to support micro, very small industries, people starting out and coming up. So if you go to them and tell them, I have a project, and this is my project, there is some support that they can arrange for you. And just let's uh, bear in mind that support is not necessarily financial. Because a lot of the time, people think that you need to have money in order to start doing something for yourself. That is wrong. If money is your biggest obstacle, then you are not ready. Hmm. But if you go to the streets of Accra and, and a young person want to be very entrepreneurial, the first question is, where would the money come from? So the way you are presenting it, you are making it too easy that if money is the problem, it's like you are not ready. You are not ready. Because you find out that your entrepreneurial instinct includes how to find money. If you start up, who should loan you money? You are a startup, you don't have any experience. Mm -hmm. If you go to a bank, and remember that the money in the bank is coming from somebody's savings, mm -hmm. and the bank does not want to lose that money, should the bank take that money and give it to somebody who has no track record, who has no experience, who hasn't managed 1,000 CDs before, and yet wants 100,000 CDs? That will not be very prudent on the part of a bank. So everywhere in the world, startups, normally the way startups find money is through what we call the family and friends. People who you know, who for some reason have known you as a child, grown up, your parents, your siblings, your uncles, your nephews, who think that this nephew of ours, this brother of ours has entrepreneurial instinct and he wants to do something. So let's help him. Let's invest in him. So they will give you some of the very, and a startup, normally, you must start small. Mm. There's no point you have just left school, you want to start a business, and you need 10 million CDs before you want to start it. You are not in the right business because you do not know how to manage 10 million CDs. So startups, you start with something small. If it is from selling sachet water, or even washing cars, or whatever it is. You start with something small, which your own people who know you, people who trust you, people who know your character, can afford to give you money and say that if this uh, 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 relation or friend of ours wants to start selling sachet water, if I give him my 500 CDs, I know he'll pay him back. And out of that, you grow the business. You may want to actually be producing sachet water, but you start with selling it. And know that eventually, when you have established a track record, you can raise the money to buy machinery and go into production. Viewers, this is what is next. And I'm in conversation with Dr. Tony Otten Jesse. And he's sharing with us certain insight that parents, young people, students, we must all uh, I'll be part of this conversation because that we have unemployment in this country is a known fact but that we can turn things around in our favor and change the narrative change the conversation we need people like him because he is coming from inside the water and uh, so far I'm becoming convinced that at least we, we can start from somewhere if not with 10 million maybe with the little car wash money, whatever small money, families, uh, uh, siblings can raise, we can start something. It's very encouraging. Doc, 
you yeah. have had opportunity to serve as the chairman of University of Ghana Governing Council. Are you convinced that our universities and post-secondary uh, institutions are providing the requisite foundations for the next generation of ideas uh, uh, to become strong indigenous manufacturers? I think that, that there are gaps in uh, our university training, to be sincere with you. The, the top 10 or so percent of people who come out of our universities are world class. They can compete everywhere. Anywhere in the world you take them, they can compete. They are not the problem. But when you look at the rest of the people who come out, and that is where sometimes you have people saying they are not ready for industry, they are not ready for work and all that and all that. But it's not the fault of the students. First of all, our traditional university setup is based on a certain history of what the universities were set up to offer society. So to cut it short, we need to go to the curriculum which we are imparting to our students. What kind of curriculum are we giving them? Is it the curriculum which trains them to think critically, assess, and make decisions on their own? Or is it the curriculum which trains them to be cocks in a certain wheel, to be clerks, and sit somewhere and push paper? So it is, it, is, it is part of our curriculum design that we need most to look at. And I remember when I was uh, chairman of the University of Ghana Council, uh, 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 His Excellency Kofi Annan, uh, God bless his soul, helped us to get uh, some money from, I think it was Carnegie or Ford, one of those foundations, to look at a complete curriculum review of the University of Ghana curriculum. Because the way in which we teach now, you know, does not impart certain skills which you need in today's world to the student. Let me give you an example. If, if, you, if you take somebody studying physics or math and tell him that uh, 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 to measure the area of a circle, uh, uh, the formula is pi r squared. Pi r squared, so he's, he's, he's learned it, you know. But then, of what use is that formula in real life application? In other places now, people actually start learning such theory, uh, 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 such formula, from a practical point of view, of what use is it, before you even get to the theory. So we need to look at how our curriculum, not just the content of the curriculum, but in how we intend to impart the knowledge to the students. And these are, I think, fundamental reviews which could help our universities produce even better students. Look, if we are to do this review, because people like you, business people, you, you, you are into business plan development, preparation of business plan, business information, market research, you know. And, and if you are telling me we need to review that, yes, our students have all the theories, the philosophy, the pie chart, but they can also connect, you know, the relevance of pie chart to the market. If we are to go through the process of review, we may not know who is watching, but as for you, I know somebody is watching you. Where do we start from? We start from first um, assessing what we have and its relevance. How are we going about it? So somebody, I'll give you one of my favorite examples. When you study economics in the, across economics uh, departments in Ghana, you can come out with a degree in economics without having studied anything about the history of economic development in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So you come and you go to work in, let's say, uh, a finance ministry or a ministry of trade and industry or somewhere, and you are looking at policy. How do you know that this policy for export promotion, which is being suggested to you, has not been tried 30 years ago? Do you know what it, the results which came out when it was tried 30 years ago? So how do you fashion it now to suit these times? So one thing I have told uh, 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 the, the, the Department of Economics uh, some years ago is that I think we need to introduce a history of Ghana's economic development 
as a core uh, course mm. which everybody must take so that we know what we have tried before in the past we also know what were the results so that if we want to look at something like that again we have a history to guide us i mean the u.s thinks that it has gone out of the culture of booms and busts especially of recessions why because they have studied recessions constantly over time now they think that immediately they see the signs of a recession they know what to do mm. interest rates uh, 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 money supply in order to avoid another recession or to lessen the effects of that of that recession do we do the same in ghana if you look at ghana's budget statements over the past 20 30 years you'll be surprised at how many things we have tried before and yet we put back in without taking cognizance of the previous efforts and what the results were. Can you look straight into this camera and talk to managers of education? What should be different? At least we are in the beginning of a new decade. By the end of 2020 something, what should be different in educational institutions? I think it's not just in education, but across the nation. Number one, we shouldn't take criticism personally mm. but number two and even more important we should criticize constructively I mean we shouldn't criticize to destroy so that when we are making suggestions to one another our language our demeanor our very intentions for making uh, uh, for criticizing anything should be clear and should be in the national interest if you do so, then the, the petty insinuations, the insults, which make people even shy away from indulging in national debate, will go away. Mm -hmm. So two things. Number one, accept criticism. And number two, be tempered if you are criticizing in giving criticism. Mm -hmm. And maybe let me add a third. Along the line, as, uh, as in my involvement in uh, national life and things, I have learned that you never criticize something unless you have an alternative to offer. Mm. Don't criticize and live in the void. You say, I don't think this is right policy. This is why I don't think it's right policy. In this place, my suggestion is A, B, C. And why A, why B, why C? That is what we call constructive criticism. Mm. And that is what all of us, not only in education, in science, in technology, in health, in agriculture, we should all learn this if we are to stay together as a country <coughs> and progress together. Let me come back to the unemployment of our young people. You, as one of the captain of industry in Ghana, how do you see the unemployment situation? Is it a national uh, kind of abstract on our neck? Is it a, a, a national security challenge? Or is it an opportunity that this country can turn things around for the coming years? How do you see it as a business person, as industrialist? As of the, the last one you gave, there is no way a huge national population can be an albatross and a challenge if you know what to do with it. I mean, China has what? 1.2, 1.3 billion people. India has 1.1 billion people. Is it a challenge for them? And we have 30 million people, and we think it's a huge challenge, and what we don't know what to do. The very people who you see as a challenge also constitute the market to whom you will sell your goods. So, if you make ice cream, would you rather have a market of 10 million people or a market of 30 million people? And so we should see our population as an opportunity. The question is, how do we turn a population of unemployed into uh, a, a purchasing power uh, uh, having uh, a market who can demand things? And that is where things like our manufacturing comes in. You cannot have people in your country, and yet you make everything you use and sell in your country from outside your shores, for whatever reason. For whatever reason, you should aim to make as much in your country as possible. And you cannot make that much in your country, especially for a country of our size and our stage of development, 
if your primary consideration as a nation is that if we make it locally, will it be more expensive than if we import it? It will not work because at our stage of development, there's nothing you cannot start to make in Ghana today which somebody somewhere out there will not be prepared to sell to you cheaper than how you can make it yourself. Mm. Does it mean you should import everything and leave your people unemployed? That is the critical question we need to ask ourselves. American government money cannot be used to fly any airline which is not an American airline unless no American airline flies to that destination. Mm. American government money cannot be used to buy foreign vehicles which are not made in America. We use our government money to import everything. Let us come out with policy, and it's not just for rice. Let us look at the way in which we can use our own government expenditure to kickstart, to jumpstart, to get our economy going. In Dubai, you cannot start a company unless a citizen of that country is a shareholder. It doesn't matter whether he has money to pay for those shares or not. So we need to be able to stand up and fashion policy which will make use of our people. Mm. And seriously, our, our people are our greatest resource. Mm. We say that, but we don't act as if they are. We don't empower them. We don't give them advantages. We need to sit now and think about how to do these things. Mm. But some of your people are also importing labor while we have unemployment. In fact, those who are doing floor tiles, there are some uh, those in the building industry that are bringing people from outside. How do we explain that? Does it mean we have people within, but they are not ready for people like you to engage, employ? It skills development. And as part of any national development strategy, you need to have skills development. Because if I'm a contractor and I need to lay tiles, you know, I'll look for the person who will lay the tiles best, rather than starting out with the person, whether he is my uh, countryman or he comes from my village or not. But it is for us in our education, in our vocational training, to make sure that we are training people who are required in our industries. So if it is tile layers that we require, how many tile layers are we training? And how well are we training them? Such that I tell you there's nobody who, if he needs a mason or a carpenter, would go to Benin or Nigeria and bring one in, if he can find one in Ghana equally skilled. So it's, it's training. And uh, I mean, national development agenda is, has to be a complete whole. You know, you don't look at only bits and pieces of it. So you have vocational, you have TVET training, all that should be happening at the same time. Viewers, this is what is next. I'm in conversation with Dr. Tony Otin Jesse. Now, when we come back, we just want to have a short break. I will ask him to help me assess the Ghanaian ordinary average uh, worker's attitude towards work and how those who are into industry uh, uh, how they will want things to either remain the same or how to let things be different stay with us if you may we will be with you just uh, some few seconds <laughs> Inside the presidency, a lot do happen every single day. The diary of the president is never left empty. From as early as 6 a.m. to as late as 11 p.m., the president is always on his feet. Either he's receiving traditional rulers, credentials from ambassadors, or meeting visiting world leaders. His duties outside the office is quite enormous. His regular visits to various regions in rural Ghana gets him to understand the plight of our people, informing him of the most relevant policies that need to be implemented. What we do at the Communications Directory is to put all these days and hours together, either on social media or on mainstream media. And my duty is to get into the archives, compile and package them into a 30-minute presentation to you. And that's the Presidential Diary, showing at these times 
on this network. Back. This is What is Ness on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And this year we promise you that we will look for people indeed who have the accumulated wisdom that we need to build ourselves and build our motherland. And we also plead with those who can advertise their programs and their products on this program, you are welcome. We will do you good. But, Doc, before the break, you as a former uh, uh, president of Association of Ghana Industry, among your colleagues, what is your assessment of the ordinary Ghanaian attitude towards work? I, ha I have a view which I know is not popular, but I believe is right. And it is that the attitude of a worker, any worker at any level, even of a, a deputy managing director or a chief of finance, is a function of the person who oversees and manages him. It is the job of the manager to bring out the best in the worker. Mm. So a lot of the time when people talk about poor worker attitude, what they do not realize is that it is a, a function of management and an indication of inadequate and sometimes poor management. I'll give you an example. I mean, the, the same workers we have in our nation who we complain about come a multinational like any of the big multinationals who come in. They take these same workers, they work with them, of course they train them, work with them, and they all are happy that Ghanaians are good workers. All these same workers go outside Ghana, and the systems in which they operate brings out the best in them. Whose job is it to put down those systems? It's the job of management. So really, as far as I'm concerned, it is the job of management to bring the best out of workers and not to go looking at workers and hoping that workers are some angels who have come from heaven and will deliver whether you have trained them or not, whether you have cultured them or not, whether you have made them understand why they should work the way you want them to work or not. Your worker attitude depends on the management which uh, controls them. Help me here. You are the, the big man sitting on top. You have a secretary, accounts officer, who comes to office with mobile phone, who is downloading uh, films, who is on phone, customers are ready, the facial outlook is not good. And you are saying that the problem is management, it's not the worker. I, I, I don't get it. If, if, if um, you have somebody let's say what, at whatever level, and you, are you have rules for the person, the rules which say that you cannot use a mobile phone whilst you are at work. Not just a rule, why you cannot do so. You cannot do so because you don't serve the customers, and it is the customers who pay us so that we have money to pay you at the end of the month. And you explain this. I remember in one of my, my, my uh, uh, earliest training programs for workers, we brought in uh, uh, Honorable Augustine Game, who, had, um, who is a, a labor specialist, you know, to, to run a series of programs for our workers and our supervisors. And he asked them a very interesting question, where does your salary come from? And you see factory floor workers. I mean, some of them said, oh, it comes from Mr. Ting, you see. Some of them said it comes from the bank. Some of them said, I mean, you know. but he took them through a process. At the end of the day, they recognized that the customer who comes and is sitting in marketing department, who you are delaying, is the one who is paying your salary. And immediately, you find a change in attitude. So you, you need to train, you need to train the people. If you don't train them, and don't just train them on the, on, the, on the basis of a needs-to-know basis. You think that, as for these people, they don't need to know uh, uh, where the company's money is coming from. 
even when the company is taking a loan there's nothing wrong with letting the workers know that we are hitting hard times we are taking a loan from the bank we are paying 25 uh, percent uh, interest per annum on it this is its effect on us as a company and this is why we should try and make enough money so that we stop taking that loan so that we can pay all of us a little bit more we should treat our workers as full human beings with understanding at the same time they are subject to the same temptations which we all have to do the wrong thing sometimes and but we can only train them and teach and educate them out of it now let me come back to association of ghana industry it's like that is the leading uh, advocacy voice in ghana when it comes to industry is there a plan and a program targeting young people who want to go into entrepreneurship um not not directly and let me correct one one popular misconception the association of ghana industries is is a voluntary association it is uh, uh, it is set up by its members it is not government funded no taxpayer money goes to it the members pay subscriptions in order to advocate for a good operating environment for industry that is what it is so nobody gives the association money to own land to anybody else that is not the role of the association many people make that kind of mistake having said that the association is always willing to help support its younger and its newer uh, members and give them directions so we have training programs sometimes they are free if we can get money for it if not you have to pay a little but there are training programs there are all sorts of programs with banks there are sorts of programs with insurance companies with even bigger companies to help you get into the world of industry and we also liaise with the national board for small scale industry which really is the government mandated body for small scale industry and where a lot more people should be looking at. And they have a young, brilliant lady now who, run, who runs it. I mean, extremely talented. I think that uh, many more people should be looking at what the MBSSI is doing. You have said in one of your publications that we should not miss business and politics. Now, what are the pitfalls if, if, if people do so? Several, several of so all. I mean, um, first we should recognize that we have a political climate in this nation which, though not surprising, is still not as healthy as uh, the political climate should be. It doesn't surprise me that it is that way, but it doesn't make it any less unhealthy. It is unhealthy. And for an entrepreneur and somebody, especially if you are starting out or if you are trying to grow a business, your concerns should be such that I don't think that you will have a lot of time to follow political matters. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have political opinions. You definitely should have. You definitely should be able to evaluate one policy against the other and decide that this is better policy and advocate to change a policy which you think is not good of. But if you want to be a politician, if you want to be in the forefront of politics, then I think that you need to leave whatever industry, whatever business you are doing, and do that. Because after all, politics is also a very specialized uh, profession. And it is not for nothing that you find that in most places, including Ghana, once you are in politics, you are supposed to declare your interest in whatever businesses in which you have. And most of the time, what people really must be doing is stepping back from the business, giving the business into neutral hands, professional hands to run, so that you can have a political career. At the end of it, you can go back. But trying to mix the two, I think, introduces pitfalls for both yourself as a politician, but also for the business you are trying to run. But is there a way that our earlier on you talk about critical, uh, you know, criticisms, yes, but objective and all that? Is there a way that we got a political orientation that uh, uh, we, we should let politics stop somewhere 
you know, I, I have in mind at uh, the moment this Ghana Beyond Aid. It seems to me it's just a wonderful idea. How can we handle it in such a way that whether people, somebody CPP, NDC, and whatever, can be roped into this that we must all come and build a nation that is beyond aid. That people will not feel intimidated that this is a political idea program coming from a political, you know, party that I don't subscribe to. How do we also play our politics that certain programs can be a more collective, non-partisan? I find it strange if anybody, for any reason, questions uh, a Ghana beyond aid agenda. It's like saying that uh, you you don't want your your family. If somebody says that your father should make enough money to take care of his family, you don't think that it is good enough. You know, I mean, it's such a basic concept of your very humanity and our very nationhood that we should be beyond it and we should strive towards it. Now, the the, the thing is that for for most of those things, our mass media have a role to play because like it or not the mass media actually set the tone and the temperature for public discourse in our country so when you wake up in the morning and three people sit behind a console and are reviewing uh, uh, newspapers and adopt a certain tone you see that it permeates the whole national psyche that it is something which our mass media should recognize their responsibility for. I cannot imagine anybody in the mass media coming out and saying Ghana Beyond Aid is a bad thing. You may question how soon it has to, it will get done, or the processes by which it will get done. That is fair. But as a concept for nation building and nationhood, I don't think that you could get, you could get better. If we need a national conversation on you know issues like that, mm -hmm. how do we handle it? Because Ghana beyond it, we must get there. Mm -hmm. You know, we sometimes election and, and and our even electoral processes are being funded by outsiders. Education, our health budget, all you know being supported. Those in NGO, civil society group, oh, but we we will need a national conversation for people to know why this is idea coming from uh, political party government but you are saying don't miss business and and politics but then you are saying such policies should go beyond politics yes of course ghana a, 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 a national cry is not politics and when i hear uh, 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 ghana beyond aid i do not hear ghana beyond aid today ghana beyond aid by the end of the year i would expect that eventually the ghana beyond aid should have a program for it so we we just like uh, uh, the malaysian said uh, uh, a middle income by the year 2020 i mean theirs was 2000 ours was 2020 and i mean these are these are if you like national objectives which every nation should have mm. So a Ghana beyond aid in the shortest possible time, if you like. There's, there, there's no reason why even our mass media should not take it up and make it a national cry, a national rally, you know. I mean, like just like in times past by one nation, one people, one destiny. One destiny. That was a national cry, you know. I mean, uh, 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 Operation, Operation Feed, feed yourself. yourself. That was a national cry. So, I mean, and, and we actually succeeded in some of those things. I mean, our people marvel at our nationhood, looking at the very many different, different ethnic groups that have come together to form the nation of Ghana. And the fact that, I mean, we are, we are, we are, we are a very stable democracy, we are living together. I mean, uh, uh, yesterday I was talking to a young lady who came to Ghana at the end of the year from Malta. She says she just Googled the safest country in West Africa to visit because she wanted to visit West Africa. And Ghana came up. Mm. So she came to Ghana. You know, I mean, these are, these are things which we should, we should be proud of as a nation mm. and find ways to enhance it rather than looking for divisions and petty squabbles amongst ourselves. 
viewers this is what is next and i'm in conversation with dr tony Ortin jesse and he is saying that there are certain issues that must be national cry such national cry in fact he's the first person to say business people should not miss politics but then he's saying that such national cries must go beyond politics there are things that must rally all of us together as a country and we'll work towards them and like oppression feed yourself one nation one people one destiny and now a national cry like ghana beyond is it's up to our political parties and politicians also especially when they succeed that they should also not over politicize such national cry i don't know you know because if you you are succeeding if we are all coming on board and you use that for campaign for votes then I just also feel that oh, the very thing we are helping you to build, you are using it against us. It's not. It's not that. That, that is not. That is not the way. When. When. Uh, let me. Let me. Let's step back and and look at uh, um, the United States. When uh, uh, I believe it was John F. Kennedy who said that he wanted to land a man on the moon by a certain date, right? And I mean all national resources everything went towards achieving that aim right this is the kind of national objective which i don't know how you are going to say uh, you are going to take ghana beyond aid and use that if you like and say that so i'm the one who put ghana beyond aid and after me ghana has to go back for aid or something no Ghana beyond it is the Ghanaians who will ensure that we go beyond it by our actions, by our activities, by our policies. I mean, the, 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 a, a government sets a tone and an agenda and puts in policies. But it's the, it's the reaction of the people taking it up and behaving and taking decisions appropriately which will make us achieve it. So when we achieve it, it's like we, we went to the, the World Cup and we, we, were, we almost got to the semi-final, right? We were all so proud of it. Did I hear somebody say that uh, uh, it was uh, because of me that Ghana got to the semi-final or got to the quarter-final? And so vote for me because of that. Mm. It doesn't happen that way. So I, 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 I do not think that this is the kind of thing which you would go out and say vote for me because i said ghana beyond it or i help ghana to 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 reach that goal if we do we do reach it look there's a statement that you've made and let me quote uh, um you here you have said that it is industrialization that can provide us with the kind of long-term sustainable middle class that we 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 we, we want we desire do you still hold to that statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. And really, uh, uh, if a nation is to develop, you need uh, to have at least 60 to 70 percent of your population within that middle class bracket. I mean, I mean uh, 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 students of economic development will, will teach you. And that is where we need, we need to go. We need to build a huge middle class. And how do we build a huge middle class? How can you make sure that your engineers are employed? Like I said recently, I mean, how can you have a developing country which has poor roads, no bridges, no schools, no hospitals, and yet all your engineers are unemployed? I mean, it's, 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 it's almost a, a paradox. So it is for us to make sure that we have we build that middle class and the way we do it is by making most of the things we need to make within our borders mm -hmm. and when we make it don't forget that the more you make things the more experience you get at making it so the lower the cost of making it will become so then the benefit will spread to everybody but if you don't start making it then you have nothing to spread so your people will remain poor. So very few of them can, can afford what, what will come. And, and, and you, you, you consign yourself to mediocrity as a nation. I mean, manufacturing is, is, is non-negotiable. There was a time when people thought that maybe we could leapfrog and go to the service sector because of all these computers and all that and all. But you find that the use of IT 
it has further enhanced manufacturing even more from the Boeings and the uh, and, uh, 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 super tankers and th that is all IT used in, a, in a, an even more dramatic and efficient way I mean lowering costs across manufacturing so if you don't start I mean what is the basis of China's emergence China has become the, they call it the factory of the world they are making everything for the world and that is the only way they could draw 1.3 billion people out of poverty so we need to emulate it and across southeast asia vietnam malaysia did it indonesia is the same thing they have done why do we want to reinvent the wheel why don't we do it the same way how can we get this idea to become a cutting edge you know in our academic program even traditional leadership I, 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 will, I will come back to you like that. How do I think I'm a religious person? You know, how do we get that, this idea that we must use industrialization to get the, the middle class that we need? How do we get this to become everyday language in our media, even when traditional leaders meet? Well, now the political parties are working on their manifesto. How do we get this that you have just mentioned to be a cutting edge? In our in our lifestyle in this country one is it possible for us to get it today but but how do we do it it is, it is in it's in uh, it's in the visions which our leaders set us uh, when we break down that vision and look at how to arrive at that vision whether it's uh, poverty reduction or is wealth creation or some of the other uh, national visions which have been set for us uh, uh, in the over the past 20 years or so of our democracy you know we need to sit down and break those visions down and say that this is how we are going to achieve it and if we do that in a logical consistent conscious manner we will find that at the middle of it is making things for ourselves which is what manufacturing is all about but if we if we if we leave it to just mere sloganeering and not break it down to how it is to be done you know have a logical framework for achieving it and work at it if we do invariably inevitably we will come to the fact that we need to make more things just like we we started out Somebody said, we must grow more rice. We grew rice. All of a sudden, the rice, there was nobody to buy. Somebody said, look, we should all buy made in Ghana rice. Everybody was buying. Then all of a sudden, he said, there isn't even enough of the made in Ghana rice to buy. But it doesn't matter. It's a start. So now those who are growing it will grow even more. That is the way a society makes things. And we should, we should, so we should go beyond only, only agricultural produce. Of course, we should spread it across rice to maize to other agriculture, but we should go even into agro processing, into manufacturing. Then we find out that we will be really be growing a country. And those things you find provide the kind of jobs, career giving jobs, mm. jobs which don't depend on the ups and downs and even i mean if you have if you have a manufacturing economy you will find that even your tax collections are more consistent mm. because manufacturing companies don't come one year and die after two or three years once they start and manage to ramp up to a certain level you can be sure that for 10 15 years they'll be there there'll be acquisitions people will take some over some will grow but at the uh, at the bottom line, your revenue is consistent and it keeps coming. And then you, start, you stop depending on all your revenue coming from import duty. So when, I mean, uh, it, 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 when there is fraud at your port, I mean, your country is in, is in trouble. Your revenue should be coming from production. What people have produced, when your people are buying it and selling it and using it, as part of their consumption when they pay, then you are getting your revenue. No. And that is you consistent. Said that our revenue must come from production. <laughs> yes, it must come from production. Post-production, let me put it that way. It must come post-production. You don't get your revenue before you have produced it. 
every 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 productive country in this world imports raw material of some sort or other. Raw material is the cheapest thing to import, and Africa is selling a lot of it. Right? You find most countries which buy raw material when it gets into their country, they don't charge duty on it. Mm. They let they because they want you to produce with it. Once you have produced with it and you are going to sell the higher value, that is when they put taxes. In that is what we do in, in this Africa, country. Not just in this country. In Africa, it's the opposite. We are charging our taxes at the port so that when the things come in, including raw material, I mean, in Ghana now, if you bring raw material, you have to pay a 5% import duty on it because of a common external tariff. Even before you have produced it, even before you have done anything to it, you are paying duty on it. Why? Because we don't have the confidence and we don't have the systems to make sure that post you can wait for production. Because we are so starved of national resources that we need the money fast. Hmm. I don't know, but I hope, especially now that the various political parties are working on their manifestos, somebody will listen to this uh, uh, words of wisdom from Dr. Tony Otin Jesse. The fact that we must focus our revenue generation on production and not just raw materials that people need to produce, you know. So we do post production, that is where we must target uh, the oh, revenue. And yeah. then they need uh, to change the narratives, change the whole uh, economic narrative because now. <laughs> But I'm a pastor. I need help. We have young people in our churches. Now, how can the churches also turn these huge numbers of young people, you know, into industry, into entrepreneurship? That we should not just keep them there. They clap, they dance, they go home still unemployed. Help me and my people who keep these young people in churches. Same in the mocks also, because Ghanaian young people, you go elsewhere, you don't have young people in churches uh, like we do. We have them. How do we, you know, also fill the gap? How can the religious people faith base? Uh, help me, I need help. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the kernel of the matter is that those young people, Either somebody should create jobs so that they can have jobs and they work, or they should be entrepreneurs themselves and start something, mm. which seems to be the preferred way our nation is going. But honestly, it's not every young man who wants to start a business. On the contrary, most young people just want a job. Very few of them want to start a business on their own. And it's not surprising. I mean, starting a business is not as easy as it sounds, you know. So what we need to do, the people who have shown a proven track record in starting and growing businesses, we should encourage them to grow even more businesses, to start new ones, to expand what they have so that they can absorb some of the young people. And, I mean, Korea chose how many? They said there were five or six uh, uh, names and said that, look, you are going to be the basis of our industrialization and give them everything they need to grow new companies, to grow new businesses. We should look at that. The other side of it, which may not be pleasant to many pastors, is that these young unemployed people who come and sing and dance and clap in church, we are also not helping them when we take all the money we come out of their pockets either by way of whatever we call it. But the end process is that the young people, every time they come to church, they go home poorer than when they came into church. And yet we expect them to try and do something for themselves. So then they come to church, give their money away, and hope that somehow some miracle will let them get more money. It doesn't work that way. We should encourage them, set up, savings groups, uh, 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 cooperatives within them, so that they can pull their monies together and help some of them to start something. 
rather than the church is taking the money out of their pockets and they are going home without money. I mean, we should, we should, we should, face, we should face the facts of the matter that unfortunately in our nation, <laughs> if we are not careful, religion seems on the way to be becoming a leech on, on our people. Even our mothers who sell in the market, they come to church, their whole collections in a week, they leave part of it there, and then they go, they go, they, they go away. So let us help them, put them together, if you like, in groups, even from forming Susu, so that they can get some of their small capital to start their own small businesses if they want to. Let the church also help them. Let the church arrange entrepreneurial training mm. for them. Bring people and say that, look, 20 of you in a group, somebody is coming to teach you entrepreneurship and how to go about it, networking, all the, 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 the recognized uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, KPIs. Teach them <coughs> what, what it is. And then you yourselves, for the next six months, instead of your paying tithes and collections every day, let's put together in a pool and give it to one or two of you to start something. And we'll all be looking at you, you know, so that when you do well, you pay it back, someone else can also start something. Let's put our mouth where our money is, or is the other way around? <laughs> we put our <laughs> money where our <laughs> mouth is. <laughs> you know, but let's, let's show a commitment to them. Mm. And I think that that is the way which we should be encouraging in our churches, in our mosques, because whether we like it or not, we are, we are, we are spiritual people. And we are drawn very much towards God in some form or other. So let's use that God culture within us in a productive manner rather than in an exploitative manner. There are some young people who are watching us who are praying that they can become, like I started this conversation, Dr. Esther Oklu, Apia Menka, they become like Nano Usua Ferry, mm -hmm. Dr. Yawadu, mm -hmm. like Dr. Uh, uh, Tony mm -hmm. Jesse, or Tim, uh, uh, Jesse, and many more you even add. Please look to this camera and encourage them. How do they do it? That one day from this conversation will produce another Tony or Tim Jesse. What I'll say to young people across our nation, first of all, get as much education as you can. Don't let up any chance to get educated. Please take it, you know. And then number two, you should learn to have a savings habit. You should learn to postpone present pleasure. No matter how small it is, learn to keep your money aside grow up a savings because one day the opportunity will come for you to use that savings for even more productive things don't consume all your money or whatever comes into your hands learn to save and then seek knowledge and seek information you have you have i mean this is the information age on google there's nothing you can find how to do things there, there, there are programs on television we say how to do things. In Ghana, our media does not show such things. So let our media also be development oriented. Our media is full of young people. But when the young people in our media sit on the radio in the morning, their interest is review the newspapers and then moan and groan about how bad our nation is. Our nation is not bad. I was in this country 60 years ago. I know what it, it was then. This is a much better country. This country is doing well. Steadily over time, we are improving as a country. We need to be proud of our country. We need to talk of our achievements. Media, find some things apart from reviewing newspapers and feeling sorry for ourselves and for everybody. There are other angles that media can push. If you like, I'll give you an example. Hmm. We've just had no, a very successful conclude, but <laughs> go go ahead, go ahead. The, we just had the a producer is <laughs> saying that you must say it, even though they are prompting me that we go beyond that, but they want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a very successful year of return. Yes, I don't see the media doing any follow-up stories. Who are the people who came? Why did they come? What was their experience here? I mean, we should, we should be milking this for content for the next six months. 
I mean, some of the stories are heroic. Some are tragic. This lady I was tell, talking about who came from Malta. You know what happened to her? She searched on, the, on, 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 uh, on Google, found Ghana as the safest place to come to, and then she looked for a hotel and found that she was, she found a hotel in Jamestown. She didn't know where Jamestown is. So she went to Jamestown, and in the night, rats and cockroaches. So, I mean, she had to look for help. And fortunately, some good Samaritan found her and took her to a proper hotel. But these are experiences which we should be, we should be talking about. People came, people found spouses, people found wives. People are starting new businesses out of a year of return. Why, why isn't our press carrying on with it? Do we just want to for, forget about it? I mean, these are our successes as a nation which we should be enjoying. I will plead with you, we will need you for another time. But this, uh, they, they are saying even next week, but I haven't, I haven't asked you, but our viewers are asking that we bring you back next week, especially the role the church can play in the saving culture IDN, where the media must come in, that the media that uh, something must change. There should not always be paper review, but now we must create a platform that people learn industry and entrepreneurship. Uh, but they also keep reminding me that we must sign up. Viewers, I have been in this interesting conversation with Dr. Tony Otin Jesse. Uh, I have been saying that he's a former president of Association of Ghana Industry, but he's also the managing director, chairman and managing director of Tropical Cable and Conductor Limited, a man of many parts from electricity, uh, ECG, and many more. And he has actually set us thinking, especially our young people and the challenge of unemployment, that can we turn this challenge into opportunity in the coming years. He has raised very important issues for us that we need to take time to process. Uh, on behalf of my viewers, thank you very much thank you for also. coming. Very